anyway, they'll have Ralph Ring on. I don't know if we'll get into a lot of that kind of topic. He's like mid eighties now. Um, but we're going to talk to them about letting the public know about what's going on with them now that they're safe in Arizona because they were targeted in the Paradise Fire. They lived in Paradise, California, and they literally woke up and everything was on fire and they had to grab their dog and get in their car and flee for their lives. So it's interesting because in those fires there were a lot of, let's just say, interesting people in those areas. Um, so anyway, so anyway, so what happened was is that in 2009, when I started having to go out and try to figure out legally what I could do, I, you know, was interviewed, interviewed like 25 attorneys, nobody would take my case, even though, you know, because I was holistic. And then when I was trying to submit documents with the courthouse, um, file documents against the state, um, they basically told me point blank. They said, oh yeah, well, what's this about? And um, who are you and what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a holistic practitioner and the state you know, has come around and illegally you know, cease and desist us. And in some cases, you know, we've lost our offices. And, and they said, oh yeah, well, um, we have a memo that we're not supposed to take your paperwork. You know, in law, you're supposed to accept anybody's paperwork, even if they want to represent themselves. So, um, and then the last ditch effort was that we, I went to the police department to just file a basic complaint to go along with my legal documents. And me and my friend were sitting there, and she didn't believe me about everything that was going on, you know, this massive conspiracy. And so I handed them, you know, like 10 different affidavits. They had people's names on them about, you know, what's happening, what's going on. These are from people that the state, you know, was giving them fake cease and desist and threatening them. And then, you know, their landlords had closed their offices and, you know, they couldn't even get their stuff out of their offices and um, just trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And then, you know, being pulled over by law enforcement in behalf of the state. And so these affidavits were, you know, you know, the written word of the individuals that things were happening to. So I took 10 affidavits, you know, with my complaint that I wanted to file um, with City Hall um, at the courthouse and um, just said, I just want to file a complaint. I just want to file a basic complaint um, so that I can use that, you know, with my documents um, because everybody kept saying, well, you have to go to the police department. You, know, you have to go to the police department. You have to, you know, register, you have to file a complaint, blah, 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 blah. So I was there. Anyway, what happened was is that one of the people that were behind the counter, or the law enforcement that were supposed to, you know, write the complaint, literally picks up the phone, <laughs> it calls a state representative, says, hi, I have a which, you know, she's not supposed to, she's supposed to be non-biased because I'm filing a complaint that needs to be investigated. This is like, it has to be an investigation. And so here she is calling a state person. And then she says, oh yeah, I have Bridget Dolgoff here. And she has uh, 10 affidavits from, and then she starts listing off the names of the individuals. And then, and then starts to kind of briefly give them a rundown about what it's about. And then the state said, you know, oh yeah, we'll just shut them down. You know, they don't take anything from them, blah, 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 just kick them out. And so she gets off the phone and here now confidentiality, right? And she's supposed to be, you know, putting in an order for an investigation. Like all the confidentiality is gone. There's not going to be a proper investigation. She just like basically right in front of us turned us in to the state and notified them of, of what we were doing. Um, and that was kind of like, you know, like a giant slap in the face. And she got off the phone and looked at us and she said, well, you know, law enforcement um, can't, you know, pers or, you know, we, we're not going to be able to take your complaint because the state trumps, you know, the police department. And I was just like, wow. 
I mean, that is like the most craziest thing ever. And so after that, my friend, she basically said, we don't have civil rights, do we? And I said, we don't. When you're in trouble and you think that you have a civil right and that you have the right to, you know, whatever, you don't have the right to it. You don't have the right to any of it. Um, and uh, it, it makes you think a lot about um, when you're listening to people who, you know, haven't been through the ringer and who haven't, uh, don't really understand, you know, how everything works. And, you know, they're yelling about their rights as a citizen and all this other stuff. It's like, it's ludicrous because they don't know. I mean, a lot of people don't really know until you've kind of been down the road um, in order to kind of figure it out. So when I ended up having to go, kind of go into hiding and living out in the desert kind of on a couch while I was citizen lobbying for 100 hours a week for six months and trying to help these other brilliant legal people. And during that time frame, I just was surrounded, you know, by legal people, you know, I was surrounded by this common law group. I was surrounded by where I was living with, you know, really brilliant legal people. And I was working, you know, at the legislature, so this lobbying with seven other extremely brilliant legal people fighting, you know, fighting to save whatever we could save for citizens. Um, and so during that time frame is when I finally, you know, got off the fence, when I really decided that, you know, I'm, I'm really going to have to decide how I'm going to live and what that looks like, and I mean, there's just no, you know, there was just no way that you can go back. And that's a, a thing that, you know, sometimes people say they wish they could go back. Well, there's no going back. I mean, once you've been attacked and destroyed, I mean, there's no going back. I mean, you either, like, you know, throw yourself under the bridge and go live under the bridge and you know, take your beatings and lashings from the state and the government, you know, or you fight. You know, and though, so that's what I decided to do. It's fight. funny because it's not only the state and government that we're fighting, but we're fighting ourselves also. And the interpersonal yeah, relationships, so many people enforcing what they think is right on other people. <laughs> without having the perspective of where each person's coming from. But in the new way, what we're really trying to do is make sure that individual rights are first and that nobody has their individual rights walked over, but also how to figure out the learned behaviors that we need to change by each of us first figuring out what we need for ourselves, by going on that journey to figure out that almost everything they taught us is unreal, but it's not unreal that it's not there. It's like unreal because it's created reality version of Hollywood. And what we've watched growing up on television, movies, even the songs that we listen to, it's sort of funny because we started with Super Tramp and I, I blew the opening because I was looking, I forgot that I had Super Tramp hooked up, but the song that we chose off Breakfast in America, School, had to do with the fact that school has lied to us from when we were children and each of us has some embedded knowledge of specifics because we got further down the rabbit hole than other people on whatever rabbit hole we found of interest. And now that we're coming out of our rabbit holes, we're finding that we have a unity in diversity by being each other. And the game is really trying to keep us all divided in unity as opposed to united in division. And if we look at what's out there in the world, 
There's some people who are running it by keeping us united in division and using the country as a way of keeping us united when the concept of countries is completely corporate. So we're on to something here. And I wanted to say that that was an excellent summary in the last hour of what we're facing by trying to use the system in any way and how to just trump the system. But in order to trump the system, how many hours did you have to spend to learn how the system worked and then to devise the paperwork? I mean, just to get to the point where you can write paperwork, ah, oh, that's an adventure. You're going to tell us about that, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the big things was that I didn't really want to go down... I didn't really want to go down the paperwork trail. And, and this is, okay, so this is the other problem that I was facing. Okay, we have the old Constitution of the United States, but it's so old that it was before women's rights, right? So when they copy-pasted the Constitution that they have now, which is a corporation constitution of the... Um, United States of America, which is a corporation which you're under as a lost vessel, which they create money and everything off of you and give you all these accounts. Your drivers, anything that has a number on it is an account that they hold, that they're making money off of you. So security number, driver's license, birth certificate. Nowadays, people should really take a look at birth certificates because they look just like stock certificates. And in some cases, They'll have in the smallest print on the left-hand side note of the United States of America, which means your baby that you just had in a hospital, which is a port, a port of entry, and your doctor is not a doctor, he's a dock attendant because he's registering the ship, which is the mother, the vessel, who's come into port to deliver the goods, which is the birth. She's delivering what's in the birth right and so the doctor registers it as a commodity right a birth registration you register everything at the port of entry right so birth certificate is a registration of a commodity and a product and this is why they can come to your house and take your children whenever they want because you don't own them you have them in a hospital and you allow them to be registered as a commodity that the government owns and so this is the thing is like when we start to walk down this road of paperwork, we have to start thinking about what kind of participation we are in in the system and how we do that. So the factualized trust that hopefully we'll talk about definitely, and I have to try to format it in a way that I can figure out how to link it so that people can get a copy of it. So I'm going to have to actually do some extra work um, in order to provide some of these documents um, to people if they're interested, you know, in, in doing another show about it. But today we're talking about the World Passport. Um, but, you know, in the Factualized Trust, we include all of the um, system documents and accounts, and then we have the power of attorney, which means that I'm, you know, I'm the trustee of the vessel as well so we did it in a way where because it it's just not the average person is just not going to be able to represent them with documents like winston shroud did judge anna did you know and and i you know if you're smart enough to figure it out and and you're smart enough to represent yourself in a legal fashion. But under con original constitutional law, I'm still seen as a commodity as a woman, which means that in order for me to file these documents with courts, like Judge Anna's documents or Winston Shroud's documents, I have to have a representative that's a man. Right? I have to have a representative that will go in there and Submit. I have to have a father or a husband. I have neither. Um, and I just didn't want 
to have to put all of my legal stuff in the basket of somebody else. So, you know, a few years ago when the factualized trust came out and we really took a look at it and I had used the UCCs that Heather Tucci had created to create us as sovereign energy beings, returning us back to that. Um, I had used those against the state in 2012, I think. Um, the state came after me again, and so I filed a whole bunch of legal notices against them. And um, in the legal notice, I put the UCC codes that Heather Tutushi did that um, basically, you know, put them out of business, kind of notified them where they're at. And then after shortly after that, then the factualized trust came out. And then we did our own due diligence because we felt like the factualized trust wasn't the be all, um, but it was the bridge from where we were at to the future. And it's also something that everyone can do and everybody can understand. And then we created the power of attorney doc, the expatriate doc, and then we also have a another banking doc, like a constrictive, constrictive document that we have as well. Um, as soon as everything shifts here, you're going to have to give them blood. You're going to have to give them two drops of blood that they're going to have on file. And they say this is to you so that they can, you know, recognize you as the owner of the money that's in your bank account. But this is about them, you know, patenting each individual's DNA strand as further, you know, ownership over you. So the expatriate doc, we kind of added some stuff in there about, um, that's kind of like kind of the two docs that, that I, we've been working on lately and the constrictive doc has a lot to do with um, being able to present those documents, you know, at your, at your bank or if you need to get a bank account so that you don't have to give them blood. And if you do give them blood, um, then you still have legal ownership over your blood. And it kind of makes them think about what they're getting involved in. And this is the deal. Legal documents are not the be all. I mean, anyone can refuse your documents at any time. Um, people always say to me, like, you know, people are freaked out and paranoid about, you know, the world passport. Well, I'm blacklisted in the United States for numerous reasons. You know, I had a, um, I had a brilliant best friend of mine who was my business partner in creating, um, you know, alternative medicine centers, you know, around the United States. Um, and we were even going to have insurance and, and all kinds of stuff. I and mean, you would have been able to get all kinds of just unbelievable, amazing treatments and everything else and whatever cures were available. And the government hated him and eventually murdered him. So, um, You know, for a long time, they just were, you know, following me around and gang stalking me and doing all kinds of stuff to me. So, and then on top of it, I decided to sit as a mobby and I'm not going, you know, to lay down and, you know, let them destroy my life. I mean, they did destroy it, but I mean, mentally and emotionally, they didn't destroy me um, because of my path and my process, you know, with the documents. And with the documents, it, it changes you. I mean, it's not just something you should do to solve something, but it's something that you should really take seriously as a path and, and, and the choices that you're going to make. Like, I don't get loans. I would never get a mortgage at this point because it goes against, it goes against what I know. You know, I'll never own that property. Um, if I get a loan, I'm in contract with somebody. And I'll tell you what, like the most shocking thing was, you know, like, I don't know, five years ago, I went down to AT&T, and I don't do cell phones, but I got a tablet with data, and I do Skype phone number and voicemail. Um, but 
three years after that, I looked it up on my QCIP number, my Social Security number online. And, and those effing, you know, buttholes, they, they pulled a bond on me and a life insurance policy just because I got in contract with AT&T. And in some cases, these, you know, bonds are like $300 million. I mean, we had an FBI agent for a while there that was helping people to get the titles to their houses because the banks were like totally in fraud. <clears throat> and there were like 10 people here in Nevada that got the titles free and clear from the bank from their house because of the paperwork. But this FBI guy, he was retired and he could get in all the systems and we didn't give out his name or anything like that. He just worked as part of the Lighthouse group to help people. And some friends of mine, they were an older couple and they have this house and it's not, wasn't it really an expensive house? It was like $128,000 house. And they found that when they, the husband and wife signed on the documents um, to get the loan for the house, that the bank pulled a $300 million bond on both of them and a $300 million life insurance policy on both of them. So if they died, they got 300, you know, $600 million, you know, accidental death. Oh, yeah, wonder how how much, you know, how many times is there so many accidental deaths that weren't accidental so that the banks could get paid out on their money that they have against us that we don't even know about. And this stuff rides on hedge funds. So having legal documents is not going to change that, right? It's not going to change your mortgage contract. It's not going to you know, change your contract with, you know, the state for business license. It's not going to change a lot of that stuff. So sometimes you have to make a decision about what you're going to participate in. I just don't do debt. And I'm not getting in contract with anybody financially so that it can be used against me to keep, you know, perpetrating crimes against humanity. So there's just a lot of things that have to be taken into consideration. It's kind of a long road, you know, when you start the process of who am I, what am I, you know, what am I going to choose to participate in? Um, and I just really want to be part of my solution, not the solution, but my solution. So there are just a lot of things that I really try to stay out and avoid. So one of the things that, um, um, and, you know, I have to tell people that yeah, I was super, tra I've been super traumatized for years. I've had a lot of really crazy stuff that's happened. Um, pretty much my entire family died from 98 to 2003. Um, I had brain cancer. Um, you know, I had um, two of my closest friends murdered. Um, you know... Um, all these legal problems with my private practice. And, you know, before before the state, you know, came after me, you know, I had been in private practice, I don't know, like 18 years or something like that. Maybe, I don't know. And never had not one problem. And was book solid for three months. You couldn't even get an appointment to see me. And very rarely did anybody ever um, cancel their appointments because it was so difficult to see me. And, you know, I saw like six or seven people a day, five to six days a week. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this stuff really damaged my reputation. And, you know, um, so it's been a long, um, it's been a really, the last 30 years have been a really long journey. And I was a whistleblower, you know, 27 years ago, 28 years ago. So I've been at this stuff for a really long time. Um, and uh, Lakota Sioux Medicine Woman found me, and I did an apprenticeship with her for like a year. And she had been kidnapped from NASA, and, you know, that's a whole other story. But she would have people that came to her for healing work that, you know, were whistle big whistleblowers, like in the CIA, the guy that developed the chip she knew. He came to the area where we were at. Um, he was trying to educate people about what the government was going to do with it. Um, there was a guy who had been tortured, who was CIA, who wrote a book and was trying to expose that, you know, the U.S. government basically gave 
you know, all the people in Africa, smallpox vaccination, 78 and 79, that also contained HIV virus. Um, and, you know, so I've been on this road for a really, really long time. And this is the thing is, regardless if your documents work or they don't work or whatever is going to happen, it has to do with energy and it has to do with you representing you and how you represent yourself. Early on when I was writing a lot of the notices and stuff like that, I was doing it out of fear because I was terrified. I mean, did they work? Did they back people off? They sure as hell did, right? But I know now that a lot of being more proactive with, you know, like my factualized trust, my POA, um, and some of these other docs um, that representing myself in that manner and being confident in that creates a whole other energetic realm that I get to operate in. And I'm not operating against the system. I'm operating um, with my system in the system. <laughs> so I guess I'm kind of like a virus, right? <laughs> no, actually, in legal terms, what you're doing is you are being sujuris while acting pro se as yourself. Yeah. I mean, I'm operating, yeah. And so the thing is, is like, you just have to decide, like, a lot of people want to stay away from the documents. And it's tough. It's, they're tough. It's, a lot of it is just really, really hard to... Um, understand um and um and you know you have to realize like winston shroud right now he's he's in jail for 10 years um and he he did some things that they couldn't get him out of legally um he claimed insanity and um and because you know he said he talked to ufos and et beings and, and they've been helping him and all this other stuff well when it came down to it they didn't help him and the same thing with Heather Tucci. You know, if you followed a lot of her stuff, you know, she talks about early on that, you know, she wasn't going to serve any time in jail because the pow these other powers were telling her that, you know, they were going to take care of her and protect her and don't worry about it and all this other stuff. So the other thing, too, is, like, a lot of people think that they're operating with, you know, the Galactic Federation and channeling all this other stuff when, what they're doing is they're involved with the reptilians and the reptilians are telling them exactly what they want to hear, which is sidelining their work, distracting them and making them important. And they're not important. So they're being given false information from the entities that they have relationships with. <laughs> and that's a whole other long yeah, know, story. That, that's a whole so, nother show, um, not this one. <laughs> here in a few minutes and kind of go over that so um, if people kind of want to take notes about how to fill it out and um, get it sent in and they're super awesome people um, they will email you as soon as they get to your application and remember it can take you know it can take like 12 weeks once once you send it um, so that's one of the reasons I wanted to start with the world birth certificate and the World passport is because it's going to take a lot longer to get done and you're going to need those to you know be your own system operating in the in the outside in that system um so there was this uh, there was one of the guys that was on what the bleep do we know and he's like this irish theologian guy probably one of my most favorite people that i followed after i went and saw what the bleep do we know here in uh, 
I went to Grass Valley to see it when it premiered at the movie theaters, like, I don't know, 2003 or something like that. And, um, and he was my favorite guy, and I can't remember what his name was, but he later went on after with the beep, and they went worldwide. And what they did is they had like a hundred questionnaire, um, you know, questionnaire that they gave people. And they, I don't know how many people they did, thousands of people. And they went to every country. They targeted everybody's who had all kinds of different belief systems. And then when the data came in, what they found was that it didn't matter if you were atheist, that you were, you were born to an atheist family, or that you were this, or you were that, or you thought you were this, or you thought you were that. It all came down to that everybody that they polled on this questionnaire were running programs from Christianity. So sometimes, you know, breaking the belief systems is, you know, genetically, basically hereditarily, um, you know, developed in the cellular engineering of our structure. And for a lot of people, they would much rather die than actually have to break that cellular system. And it can be hard when, you know, the body's designed to run this system and this program, and then you get into a place where you are going to change that and you have to go through like major emotional upheaval and, and, and just all kinds of stuff. And then your body gets really sick. You go into like a major healing crisis and there's a lot of reason why. And so when you're dealing with these systems that are old, that, have, that are controlling us, um, it becomes a genetic part of our body. And Bruce Lipton has a really good story about it, about a kid who was born a phenom piano player. I'll just get to the fast part of this. Um, and so it makes this legal document stuff just way more intense, you know, um, because it's kind of like calling us to the plate. And sometimes it can be hard to focus on the legal documents. It can be really hard about handing them to people. It can be really hard about how we deal with uh, the outside world and it, it can cause like a lot of really serious drama in us and emotional upheaval because we're going against something, not just saying it verbally, but we're actually, you know, pounding the pavement with it. And it can be terrifying. It can be a really terrifying um, situation for ourselves and our physical body um, because it's been hereditarily designed through how many generations were before us that, you know, did it this way, followed along, don't get in trouble, don't talk to the police, you know, don't go to the legislature and uphold your civil duties, <laughs> you know, don't, don't do this, and don't do that, and, you know, vote this way, so, um, and believe this, and believe this way, so a lot of times it can actually, you know, really harshly wreck people. Um, and so Bruce Lipton talks about how there was this um, young boy and he was a piano phenom and um, he was fantastic, but he was told all the time by his parents that, you know, he like wasn't good enough and whatever else. And, and even as a young child, he was, you know, past the point of any pianist in the world. And when he was 18, he ended up getting, and I, I don't know where the place was, but he got to actually perform at like one of the most important places in the world for pianists. You know, it's kind of like when you get invited to go there, you are the daddy Mac of the piano world. So he performs and like halfway through, he's just doing, you know, his regular performing. And there's a point where he decides in that performance that he's going to far exceed himself and he's just going to blow the doors off. But because of all this cellular memory that he has in his body, his body is actually trying to like hold him back. And so he's fighting with his body at this piano and he's just like going for it, you know? Well, by the time that the um, solo, the piano solo that he performed, and it was just so mind blowing that people were just, you know, gasping uh, at the end of it, just shocked. He actually, his mind cracked and he had a full-on mental breakdown and fell onto the piano um, and never came back from the breakdown. 
because in order to pass push past that cellular memory, um, he had to crack the vessel that he was in, and so he lived in a mental hospital for the rest of his life. So, you know, coming up and confronting a lot of this stuff can be, um, you know, you have to kind of be prepared, you know, that other people around you may not understand, um, the world around you is not going to understand, and you just have to proceed. And the more of us that, you know, stand out, the more of us that participate, you know, in this reality and the, in which the way that we want to participate in it um, is really what's going to change it. So on the, um, I just wanted to talk about this application real quick. And so I think Lenny posted the, it's um, www.worldservice.org. And then, um, and then this is the document area on it. And it just has one application, and there's like a link there. It says print application form. And you just can handwrite it. Um, it's super easy. There's just not a lot of crazy stuff going on. And it gives you kind of the money. And it talks about on the main page, like how much money you're going to need in order to send it in, um, kind of a thing. But I got the 10 year. There's a um, world passport, uh, and you can get the three, five, or ten years. I just got the ten year. It's like a hundred dollars, and then I got the world birth certificate. And so if you look over, so if you're at the top, and it doesn't really matter. It gives you a choice of. And then it goes down into how many years you want your passport. Um, and so I did 10 years. And then in the other side, I did a, you know, you want to check off the box for the birth certificate. Um, and then um, and then it goes down and talks about the fees that you have to send in with it. And well, I sent extra money in because these people are doing an amazing service. And so this is the point where I want to talk to you about. The World Passport has been around since 1955. There was a guy who had been in the military who actually started it and designed it in the US. And people, you can go on YouTube and people use it to go all over the place. People will say things to me, well, you know, will they, will another country refuse the World Passport? Well, will another country refuse your US passport? Of course, if you have to apply for a visa, um, anything can be refused, right? Um, anything can be. So far, you know, going to the bank or needing my world passport as a photo ID, it has not been refused at all. It can actually be run through a machine. It's just like every other passport. However, it's based on universal law, right? Um, international law that you as a sovereign being have the right to leave your country at any point in time that you want to and return back to that country anytime you want to without anyone standing in the way. And that's what it's based on. And there's a law with the UN. So this is not a UN based passport. This has this passport has nothing to do with the UN. It only has basic principle of your sovereign right to be able to leave or come back at any time that you want, right? As a universal sovereign world traveler, world citizen, without being, you know, harassed or stopped. All right, and then it has like the basic information here. Okay, so there's a little sneaky thing that you guys should be aware of. So under personal information, it'll have a place that has choose format. And it has an area that you can X for all caps or upper and lower case. You're definitely going to want to X the upper and lower case area. Because as a sovereign person, you have an upper and lower case name. Under the vessel lost at sea, 
your name is all uppercase and capitalized letters. So, and they, it's kind of interesting because when I sent this in, they sent me an email saying, well, we just want to make sure that you understand that you check the upper and lowercase box for your name. And I sent them an email back saying, yeah, um, I'm using this to support my sovereign documents. So I'm totally well aware of exactly what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, in the event that you don't want to do a whole bunch of sovereign documents and you want to travel like, you know, everybody else kind of in the system, then you may want to get, you may want to check the all caps so that, you know, you want your name and all capitalized corporation name. Um, so that way you don't red flag anyone or anything. I mean, that could be a choice that you could have. I mean, you don't have to be sovereign or have sovereign paperwork or whatever in, in, in order to get a world passport. I mean, everybody has the right to have a world passport and travel wherever and whenever they want, right? That's what it's based on. And so for my supporting my legal documents, I want the upper and lower case name because I'm returning myself back to, um, in my legal documents, the trustee and the power of attorney over my capitalized trust. So I need legal documents to support that. So I would check, you know, the upper and lower case name box. Then you just put in all your, you know, information um, that you have um, and uh, on there, your personal information. And then you have to get two passport photos, which makes you look like a criminal, like you're, they just put you in jail. Most horrid, ugly photos of all time. Um, and then you kind of go through, um, the information down through here and then you sign um, the application. So the other thing too is um, what you want to do. It says verification of identity by certification of signature or photocopy of identity papers or print of right index finger, right? So if you don't have um, you know, documents, I use everything by seal. Okay. So what, what is your seal, right? What is your legal seal as a human on the land? That's your fingerprint. In this case, it's asking for your right hand, your pointy finger fingerprint in the application fingerprint box. Um, on all my documents, I use my right thumb print in there. And I also use red ink because that's my seal. You go back to the Vatican and all these older people, you see the stuff in the movies and they have that red wax seal, right? And they pour the red wax on there and then they stamp it with some kind of ring seal or whatever else and then they send it out. But your seal is your blood right? And your fingerprint. So um, any kind of documents that you want to have that you don't, that may be refuted, you always want to have a red right thumbprint on top of your signature, because then if they have to try to refute those documents and they have a fingerprint expert come in and the red ink represents your blood, so it's a blood seal, right? Um, which is still going on today. Registered mail is based on blood seal. When you when you send your registered mail to somebody, it's based on the blood seal, um, and that you know that document. Every person that comes in contact with has to sign. It's very specifically legally done because it has to be handled. In a, in a totally different legal manner. So anyway, you're going to want to put, I signed it, and I also put my um, red index finger um, print. And you can get, you know, red ink at anywhere. It's pretty cheap. Um, and then I put my red ink fingerprint in there before I went and had it notarized. So I wanted them to have that on record, um, not only my signature, but my, my blood seal that identifies clearly who I am 
and what I am, and it also identifies me as a man on the land and human and not a vessel lost at sea. So those were a couple things that um, you may, you know, want to 